Are we good to go? Okay. <laughs> good morning. Good morning. I'm just going to grab my tech here. Good morning and welcome to worship at St. Luke's United Church. Welcome to those of you who are new. Perhaps this is your first time checking out St. Luke's online. Welcome to those of you who have been part of this church since before this building existed. Um, and welcome to those of you who are watching this not on Sunday morning, but another time this week. My name is Michiko, and it's my pleasure to be presiding over worship this morning. As I take a look around this beautiful sanctuary, I give thanks for the technology that enables us to gather, while also enabling us to do everything we can to stop the spread of COVID-19. I know that I have barely met most of you, but I want you to know that I do miss you and look forward to the fellowship that will be possible in the future. So much has changed during this pandemic, and I'm grateful that we still have this time every week to affirm that God is good and that God is making all things new in this Easter season of resurrection. As always, I want to give thanks to those who are making worship possible this morning, my socially distanced friends here, Daria for her ministry of music, and to Andrew for his ministry of technology. If you are joining on Facebook, I would love for you to say hello. I have my laptop here, which enables me to see comments as they're coming in, so feel free to say um, to pass the peace with one another and to share any prayer requests you may have as well. As we gather for worship, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the land. St. Luke's United Church is located on the territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and Attawandaraq people. And this is land subject to the Haldeman Tract Treaty. We acknowledge the territory in response to the calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and because we believe that church is a place where justice and transformation takes place. And so I pray that God will continue to guide us towards right relationships and indigenous justice. As I am in the practice of doing this every week, one of the things that I like to say is that this is just one part of the piece of building relationships, of doing justice, um, and that one of those pieces of building relationships is listening. And so as part of this morning's territory acknowledgement, I'd like to share with you some words from Haudenosaunee Confederation Chiefs Council that were shared at a press conference this week. Haudenosaunee Confederacy Chiefs Council says there is to be no more development along the Haldeman Tract without their blessing. The land in question is outlined here, a vast area along the Grand River. Chief Roger Silversmith says the Confederacy has a group that will deal with land negotiations and make sure everyone is abiding by their new rule. They're already out there and doing what they need to do. But there are several building projects currently in progress in the area, like this site on McClung Road. The chief has a clear message for developers already in the process of building on these lands. They need to stop digging in our lands and, and, and to come forward now and do, to do the process that's right. 
They need to stop what they're doing. This Mackenzie Meadows site has been occupied by Six Nations demonstrators since July. There have been several unsuccessful court injunctions to get them off the land that the developer Foxgate says was legally purchased and approved in 2015 for a 218 unit housing subdivision. Foxgate has launched a $200 million lawsuit against the Attorney General of Canada, the province, the OPP, as well as the Indigenous demonstrators who have occupied the land, halting the project. The people on this site call themselves land defenders. They say the federal government has not stepped up to negotiate with them. There was absolutely no reason whatsoever that we're in this situation nine months later. We asked spokesperson Skylar Williams if future developers should expect a similar occupation of the land they want to build on if they don't get consent from the chiefs. You know what, there's 27,000 people at Six Nations, anxious and willing to do whatever it takes to make sure that our land rights are upheld. It's not clear how this moratorium would be enforced or what exactly it would involve. On this day in 2006, the OPP raided the former Douglas Creek Estates site in Caledonia. The tense standoff ended only after the province ceded the land to Six Nations. And now, 15 years later, the Confederacy says the fight is far from over. Kelly Botello, CHCH News. For just $67, you can you can make as many videos as you want. Thanks, Andrew, for sharing that. Uh, you may be wondering why we would share a news clip as part of worship, and I think for me what's important is that we understand that when we are living our lives day to day, when we're reading the newspaper, when we're engaging in TV, that that is part of when we are asking ourselves what it means to be Christian in the world, and that I hope that um, bringing this here in this space this morning can help um, empower you and remind you that when we encounter these sorts of questions in conversations with our neighbors and family and see it in the news, that we can respond in a Christian way, that we can wonder um, how Jesus maybe would have engaged in these sort of questions and what um, it means to engage in acts of solidarity and follow Jesus's path of uh, solidarity with marginalized people. If you have a candle at home, I would uh, love for you to join me in the lighting of the Christ candle. We light this candle as a declaration that Christ is always present with us, that in our ability to create sanctuary in our homes, that we remain united through Christ. In this flickering, dancing flame that is both so small and yet so powerful, may you remember that Christ was a catalyst for radical change and that you too hold the potential to create a new and better world. The Light of Christ. Please join me in our call to worship. We come to this place because we want to know God, who helps us set aside the past to walk the path to new life. We come to these moments because we want to know Jesus, who, anoint, who anoints us with the resurrection, who shares our lives with us. We come with these people because we want to know the Spirit, who shapes us for life with God, so we may praise God forever. And let us praise God this morning with singing of More Voices 79, Spirit, Open My Heart. Good morning. I'll invite you to sing along. I think uh, you've 
perhaps heard this song before, so. Oh, hold on. Sometimes you just can't let the bad tuning of the guitar go. <laughs> Here we go. Spirit, open my heart to the joy and pain of living as you Please join me in prayer. You have done great things for us, God of great love. You make a way through our brokenness so hope might be restored. You loosen our grip on fear so we might take hold of the one who cradles us in the palms of grace. You are doing great things through us, brother of the poor. You make a way through our doubt so we may have the faith to follow as well as to serve by your side. You gather up our tears, turning them into fountains of joy. You will do great things in us, anointer of our hearts. You make a way through our hardened hearts, melting them into rivers of wonder for all. Amen. Civil rights advocate and congressman John Lewis once said the following about peace. Not one of us can rest, be happy, be at home, be at peace with ourselves, 
until we end hatred and division. And in this, I see the spirit of what I mean when I say the peace of Christ. So as you turn to those perhaps beside you or as you reach out to others online or on the phone this week, remember this. We are called to bless one another with a love so transformative it brings about the kingdom here on earth. May the peace of Christ be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you, Mitchell. Peace be with you, everyone at home. Nice to see you. God bless. This week's scripture is a familiar story, I'm sure, to many of us about doubting Thomas. And so in the name of making all things new, part of our theme for this uh, little while, I'd like to invite you to listen with new ears today to this scripture. To take a moment to think about who you are right now. What is going on in your life that perhaps is new or different from the last time you heard this scripture? And see how that impacts perhaps how certain words or phrases stand out to you. Listening to scripture is about study, it's about using our minds, but it's also about spirit. So I invite you to pay attention to your body and what you feel drawn to. A reading from the book of John. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven then. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, Jesus' disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand so that I may put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet come to believe. The word of God. Thanks be to God. As I was preparing the sermon for today, I remembered the poetry of Crystal Valentine, who wrote a piece back in 2016 in response to when a news reporter made a claim, quite adamantly, that Jesus was a white man. And as a black woman, Valentine's response is a powerful reflection on race, religion, and the current political landscape of North America. Although the poem is five years old, it felt so poignant uh, as I was reflecting this week. So I would like to offer you this morning another offering of word that is also sacred in its own way. And I will note that this is an emotionally charged piece, that it's a heavy topic. So please do your best to take care of yourself as you need to as you listen to this poem or as I share today's sermon. And that 
if you ever want to process emotions or challenge or any questions that come up from a sermon, good or bad, um, this is exactly what um, I'm here for as a minister, so I hope that you will. And yeah, now for Crystal to share her words. And the news reporter says, Jesus is white. She says it with a smile on her face, like it's the most obvious thing in the world. So sure of herself, of her privilege, her ability to change history, rewrite bodies to make them look like her. She says it the same way politicians say racism no longer exists the same way police officers call dead black boys thugs, the same way white gentrifiers call Brooklyn home. She says it with an American accent, her voice doing that American thing, crawling out of her throat, reaching to clasp onto something that does not belong to her, and I laugh to myself. What makes a black man a black man? Is it a white woman's confirmation? Is it her head nod? Is it the way she's allowed to go on national television and all correct the Bible and God himself tell him who his son really was? What makes a black man a black man? Is it the way reporters retell their deaths like fairy tales? Is it the way they cannot outrun a bullet? How can she say Jesus was a white man when he died the blackest way possible? With his hands up, with his mother watching, crying at his feet, her tears nothing more than gossip for the news reporters or prophets to document with his body left to sour in the sun with his human stripped from his black, remember that? How the whole world was saved by a black man, by a man so loved by God he called him Ken, called him black, now ain't that suspicious? Ain't that newsworthy? Ain't that something worth being killed over? Let us pray. Holy One, we gather now in this And the news report We gather now in this time of worship to hear your sacred word, to hear what it's saying to us today. We ask that you be with us that your Holy Spirit may act, act as a challenge and comfort, that we may join you in understanding better what this new day dawning may look like. Amen. Let's start today by taking a step backwards in today's text to remind ourselves that just a couple of verses earlier, it was just that morning when Mary Magdalene had seen Jesus, had been to the tomb, and then had gone and told other disciples about what had happened. You'd imagine that they might be eager to find Jesus that they would not be at home, but they would be out searching. Surely the case isn't that just everyone gave up on Jesus that quickly. Today's text starts with, when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the door of the house where the disciples had met was locked for fear of the Jews. 
Now, an pert important side piece here that I want to comment on is this language of fear of the Jews, which I don't think is necessarily the most helpful translation, but it shows up in so many translations of the Bible, I figure I might as well speak to it, um, which is to remember that um, these people that were in fear behind locked doors were Jewish themselves, and that really what the fear was was about the Jewish authorities and the way that they had used their power um, to play a role in how Jesus was crucified. Um, and so this uh, is important for us to remember in terms of how we speak about Jewish people and how this can be anti-Semitic if we don't remember context. I think it's also worth noting too that this is the thing about fear is that it can cause us to lean into stereotypes that we've been taught that fear can cause our curiosity or generosity to shrink in ways that reduces the humanity of others. But back to this scene that has been set, the disciples gathered behind locked doors. This is the thing about the violence of a crucifixion. It's not just about the bodies that are killed in one of the most painful ways imaginable, arms outstretched until an exhausted body can no longer hold itself up. So the person cannot breathe. The person usually dies from suffocation. It's not just about that one experience, but that it's a public display. That these killings are designed to terrorize and haunt others into submission, into disappearance, into their homes with the doors locked, wondering if they will be next. Wondering if it will be better to be next or have to watch someone else they care about die that way. This is what empire does. It demands and retains power through fear and submission. Empire is the force that makes us feel small and insignificant. It makes us feel like change is not possible. So who are we, truly, to blame Thomas for wanting to have proof that somehow the empire's story had been challenged? Thomas, who, have not, who would have not only witnessed Jesus' crucifixion, but would have been well aware of many other outliers and resistors who were killed in this exact same way. Thomas doesn't simply ask to see Jesus. He wants to see Jesus' scars. Thomas wants to know if this is the Jesus who suffered on the cross, if this is the Jesus who understands the pain and the fear that the disciples are dealing with. Just this past week, the trial for Derek Chauvin concluded with Chauvin being found guilty in the death of George Floyd. Sentencing is still being deliberated, but many of you may remember the story of George Floyd who died after Chauvin, a Minneapolis police officer, kneeled on his neck for nine minutes and 29 seconds. George Floyd's final words, I can't breathe, became the words that many black people across North America took to the streets to express the suffocating realities of anti-black racism and to demand accountability, justice, change, something new, something different than the experiences of seeing so many black people killed at the hands of police violence. As the trial concludes, I am mindful that those who witnessed the act of violence that day, all the family members, all of these people have spent over a year dealing with this aftermath. In today's scripture, Jesus is able to reconnect with those he loves and trusts to share what happened to him. It's an intimate moment of reconnection and perhaps closure of healing for those present. And the tenderness of this moment is made that much more apparent when I think about how so many family and friends don't get that same opportunity to grieve quietly, but are in the public eye, are out protesting in the streets during such a difficult time.
In the poem we heard earlier in the service, the author, Crystal Valentine, asks, how can we say Jesus was a white man when he died the blackest way possible, with his hands up, with his mother watching, crying at his feet? I want to be very clear in drawing connections between anti-black violence and Jesus and the way that state violence works, that I'm not saying that George Floyd was Jesus. What I am saying is that if we are to take our faith seriously, we must commit to reading the Bible with and be in community with those for whom this story of Jesus, the story of a man who was whipped, a man who was killed by state violence, that this may feel painfully real, that the Spirit invites us to understand the text in making those connections that we honor Jesus' legacy of caring for those who are marginalized and oppressed by making these modern-day connections. And I believe that the way that Jesus appears before the disciples today can teach us about what it means to be a Christian in this time, in these contexts. As Jesus walks into the room, he greets them with peace. And when he later returns and Thomas is present, he makes space for Thomas to ask questions, to voice his doubt. When we are grieving, it is a perfect time for us to feel uncertainty. And here we see Jesus' focus is on allowing people to just be with him, to help them process their grief, to not judge when the grief may come out in a way that feels uncomfortable, that may look like doubt. However, Jesus' visit is not only about being present to grief, but also to command his disciples to turn their grief into a kind of love that will continue sharing the message of Jesus. He says to the disciples after greeting them, just as my father sent me, so I send you. And Jesus commissions the disciples and breathes on them, gifting them with the Holy Spirit. And then he tells them to get out in the world that those who follow Christ are blessed with the Holy Spirit as a comfort and guide to enable us to imagine a world made new. And perhaps as another side note is perhaps to invite us to not get too caught up in the language on sin that we see in the text about the work of what uh, the disciples are doing. In terms of the original Greek, it can also speak to the larger concept of brokenness in the world. So Jesus sends the disciples into a ministry that will help people come to terms with personal role, moral wrongdoings, but also to find all the places where brokenness holds people back from God and to find ways to ensure that brokenness can be reconciled. In our scripture reading today, the disciples responded by seeking safety behind a locked door. And I think about that, that search for safety. And when we see cases such as those of Breonna Taylor, where excessive use of force during a police raid in the middle of the night led to her death. Uh, another example of a black person uh, dying in the States from police violence. Just thinking about the search for safety has taken on a new meaning. And so it has become calls to defund the police to invest in community supports and programming, and to imagine a new kind of safety that comes from the eradication of racism, resurrection. New life looks like the many ways transformative justice is becoming part of more and more mainstream conversations. And this is to say that rather than accepting that justice will come from the sources of harm, Communities are imagining new ways of healing and transforming the world that doesn't involve police, that enables communities to rely on one another, the power of loving our neighbor, the transformation possible when we treat each person as a reflection of the divine. It doesn't bring back George Floyd or Breonna Taylor or the many others in the U.S. and Canada that have died in these types of acts of injustice. 
We must be careful not to mistake the movement of the Holy Spirit in the world as some kind of happily ever after. Racism is a kind of death. It's a death dealing system. It robs life out of those who are still living by stealing quality of life. It denies people life with dignity. It kills imagination and potential. It polices hope, courage, and resistance. This is why when I talk about resurrection, it needs to mean something now, or as Carolyn Lewis, a theologian, expressed it, resurrection has to be the promise of an abundant life with God forever and now. This is my prayer for fullness, abundant, dignified life for all. May it be so. Amen. So I know what I've shared today in this sermon speaks to a lot of the profound brokenness that we see in the world today, which is why I'm really grateful for Daria's musical offering as a response to all of this. Um, a beautiful song called I Heard God's Voice, which focuses on where God is present in times of conflict and hardship, in times where we are really struggling to imagine a new way forward. And we'll know that we can stand upon this 
shared your sadness, there was trust. I was anchored, calm and centered in the river you had entered. I am broken now, but no Thank you, Daria. As we are here at this time to reflect on our offerings to God, it's uh, Daria's music that reminds me how important artists are, that the gifts, uh, the ability for new worlds to be created and dreamed is uh, so much done by artists and how important they are. Let us pray. For all that we have been given, we give you thanks, O God. We show our gratitude by sharing of our time and talents and treasures with others in return. How wonderful it is, Creator, that you invite us to be part of your transforming work in the world. May you bless all that has been shared in your name this week and use it in creating the kingdom here on earth. Amen. This time in the service now is dedicated for gathering together all of our prayers as the people of God. And so if you have any prayer requests this morning, something that you would like to celebrate, something that you would like to ask us to hold as a community, you are more than welcome to share that in the Facebook comment section. Um, And at this time as well, we'd ask that you join us in the names that have already been shared with us in terms of prayer requests. That is going to be shown through the PowerPoint. And I invite us into a time of silent prayer so that we may reflect on the name shared and gather our other prayers as well. Let us continue to pray together. In the evening when the disciples meet frightened behind locked doors, you come to them with words of peace. For wicked plots have failed and the cruelty of the world has come to nothing. And the betrayal and the denial of friends has not prevailed. Life-giving God, we give you thanks for Jesus has risen. And he comes to us now with words of peace. 
come to us today in government rooms where politicians meet, in city boardrooms where executives plan, in courtrooms where lawyers debate, come with words of peace. In hospital rooms where people are waiting, in prison cells where people are afraid, in homes where people struggle to make ends meet. Come with words of peace. Come to us whenever we are afraid, whenever we are grieving. Come to us now, we pray, in silence for those we care for and are worried about. Despite the strong and solid doors we lock to protect ourselves, to shut out the world, come to us with words of peace. This Easter, breathe on us again with your spirit, for you have overcome evil, and wicked plots fail, and the cruelty of the world comes to nothing. Renew us in the power of your spirit, that we may open the doors and go out into the world to bring words of peace to the people we meet. God, at this time, we hold in prayer the people of India. We pray for their family members here as well who are dealing with the increase of COVID. We pray all this in Jesus' name, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us sing together now an invitation to God. Teach me, God, to wonder. Teach me God to wonder 
God. Holy One, we still hear the words of your prophet echoing this week. Behold, you are making all things new. Be with us as we strive to build your new creation on earth. Bless all of you who doubt. Bless you who show up to your relationship with God with that level of authenticity, even when it is not easy. May you go out in the world this week and bring the peace of Christ to all whom you connect with. And may the love of God, the peace of Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you on this day and always. Amen.